moving to the fourth group, Aurélie, um, reporting on what was done. And after that, and the usual procedure, we break and let it just sink in. Sink in. Yes, you go first. Um, so, basically, um, building on what was said earlier, um, I think it was through mainly the second, the last parts, but the first two as well, um, and getting back to the potatoes uh, that Luciana talked about as well, the, the, the law and the ethics parts. Um, the question was a bit about how to build ethics on top of existing legislation, GDPR, or maybe also broader, in terms of, of, of evolution, what should we think about? And the general objective of the exercise was also to think out of the box. We're not talking about specifically legislation, but something else in light of ethical challenges we might be dealing with um, in the, the next couple of, of years. So we touched upon the notion of accountability. Um, and, and this idea of do we need anything else? If we think about accountability, what, what new techn technologies can bring, um, should we, we think about other types of um, mechanisms than those that are not covered by the GDPR? And um, interestingly enough, um, maybe getting back also a bit about what Peter mentioned, is there was a majority agreement on the fact that well, the GDPR was actually enough. There were enough provisions related to fairness, transparency, data minimization, best practices, and things like that. Um, so um, there was a mention also about the fact that there was clearly an evolution within the business field about the fact that companies were taking into consideration um, social corporate responsibilities. And this is also something that I, that I clearly see. And that there were trends of um, legal versus social responsibility. So things are being built up within the business realm in order to move beyond possibly this idea of compliance, at least risk and possibly something more. Um, there was also, of course, a recognition of uh, a symmetry of information, certainly if we're talking about individuals and the possibility of harm and what businesses can do today. Um, so getting back to this idea of, of harm-based approach, um, the, the, my, my main question was how, how can we surface this if, if we don't really know what technology might bring in the next years when it's being used and things like that. How could it be surfaced? How is collaboration possible for these kinds of surfaces? Surf, surfacations? No, that's not a word, but you, you get the general idea. Um, and w where the consensus was as well, well, it should be about um, training um, data protection authorities, DPOs. They should be the basis for that. Um, so to, to, to have education inside companies in terms of escalation procedures and things like that, which was kind of disappointing uh, for me. I was, I was kind of hoping for something more beyond that um, because in my feeling, um, a harm will come from other, other places as well and we need to be careful about that. Um, Christopher highlighted as well this idea that there's no conception of morality um, and he, he talked about a data protection framework from an ONG where there's collaboration in terms of defining how they could work together and things like that. That would be clearly interesting to, to follow up on. Um, we touched a bit on data traceability. So this idea of seeing where the data goes from one actor to the other, um, which links also back to accountability. Um, the, the group didn't see that as an ethical issue. Um, for me, it's part of transparency as well, um, I can understand. Um, we talked a bit about the rewards as well, this idea of, okay, how can we make sure that good data practices are being rewarded? Um, and basically, it came down to mainly the fines and the, the, the customer tr consumer trust, so this idea of doing long-term business. Um, there's possibility, I think, to explore more, and in the end as well, we talked about this idea of consent that in certain ways are rather impractical and there are alternative ways to make use of that. So the idea is really to build beyond GDPR legislation, see what would be possible, but there was like a consensus that there's already enough. Questions? Yeah. Uh, Charles.
Thank you. Uh, uh, two points. Um, one is um, the group that Luciana reported on, we also um, touched on the question of harm. And then I think one of the things we were saying in our group is that uh, if you go down the route of looking at or assessing harms and risks, uh, then there's a danger that you might uh, overlook the question of rights. And also it raises very, very important issues about how you evaluate harm and how you score it and what's the methodology for assessing harm and risk. So I wanted to, to kind of point that up because there's an area of concern there that some things might be thrown out of the window. The second point, however, uh, is it seems as though you were addressing primarily what used to be called and what still is sometimes called the private sector, the commercial sectors and so on, in which there may be certain kinds of um, um, ways around or solutions to some of the issues that you mentioned, whereas in other domains, in the public sector, in the police and criminal justice sector, some of those things look really rather different, and one might need a different basis for legitimizing certain practices and a different take on, on ethics. And I wonder whether your group looked at those, because there is a danger of simply taking a kind of private sector, company sector, <coughs> com consumer, consumerist uh, uh, um, sector um, take on the ethical issues. Yeah, we, we didn't, during the discussion, we didn't do that, but I take note of that. I understand my bias. Uh, what, one problem in practice is, let me just uh, ask you to comment, is, is time to market. Uh, there is a pressure for all kinds of reasons to bring to bring innovation to results. Uh, so, should we slow down the time to market, uh, or should we do something else to make this feasible? Did you discuss privacy by design and things like that? No, we di we didn't discuss it. It came up in terms of privacy impact assessments. Yes. So I think that companies are, are going that direction, uh, yeah. understanding that there are precautionary measures that they need to yeah. take. Uh, and then it's, it's, it's more about, okay, do we jump these hurdles? But it's again about more this risk approach and compliance approach yeah, but then than it really... It becomes a continuing process. It yes, should it should be, yes. Okay. Uh, Hilke, you want to... Yeah, there were two things from the discussion which I remembered. One thing <coughs> was that if you talk about the GDPR with all its open norms, but harm, risk, etc., there is always a judgment required. And this judgment element, we discussed a little bit whether or not that should be, has, has really an ethical dimension, or that it should be have, an, have a more ethical dimension. Uh, the point I really want to make is that uh, we also had a discussion about mainly the private sector. I must agree, uh, Charles, that we limited ourselves to mainly the private sector. And uh, the question came up and was played a big role whether or not uh, the private sector is mainly uh, incentivized by a stick, by the fact that there might be uh, negative consequences from, for not complying with the law or by not being ethical. That was a big part of our discussion, whereas I had hoped as well, and that's a point I would like to make here, it, there's, there's maybe more to it, and maybe you could also say that big companies, especially in our evolving information society where a lot has been said about power going to big companies, that their responsibility goes maybe beyond the law, strictly compliance to the law, but could also be their social corporate responsibility. And in that respect, there was a, there you can make a certain uh, comparison to what happens in environment where Companies, for instance, in Africa, oil companies uh, taking out oil off the ground are also responsible for environmental protection, although they felt responsible, although the law does not uh, does not require that. That's an element which I think should also be part of the discussion, at least I hope. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, Marty, with or without micro? No, with, because we're still recording. We're spending a lot of time uh, in this idea of where I work in, in thinking about if we're, going to, if we're going to ask organizations 
to create the processes that assure that data is used in this innovative world in, in, in a positive rather than negative way that there should be um, incentives. And the incentives are, are not sort of the traditional incentives, but the incentives are that if we're going to free organizations um, to use data more expansively to think, um, that the quid pro quo is that they have the process to think well and to think through and be able to demonstrate that. So the fact is that when you think about incentives and you think about incentives beyond the stick, because the reality is if there's limited data protection dollars, the stick has limited effect beyond a few that you really do need to say that there is a quid pro quo that goes with allowing innovation. The second point I'd like to make is I think everybody in the room must be much smarter than I am because I have real difficulty anticipating where technology will go beyond just the first and second and third application. I have real difficulty in understanding where the fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh. I mean, the example I used yesterday is I had no clue that what we're talking about Y2K in, in, in 1997, 98, 99, that that would then create the platform for cloud computing like 10 years down the road. So I just, when I'm, when this, this concept of understanding whether technology is evil or not, not evil, or how it might migrate, I just think everybody here must be much smarter than me because I can't anticipate that. Yeah, I'm wondering whether we shouldn't talk, think so much about technology, but rather about um, about people. Um, the virtual ethical approach would be to think about, for example, let, let's take an, con an example, IBM Watson. We all have a very broad conception of what IBM Watson may do technically. Huh? Nobody knows it precisely. But every single one in this room is capable to think of the implications for the people who work with Watson. Everybody already now can anticipate that we may be seeing a de-skilling of all those uh, jobs and practices who use the machine too much if the machine is not well configured. You see what I mean? Um, I think we, we discuss much too, as a too much about technology and too little about the implications of the technology for the people in a virtual ethical sense, in terms of de-skilling. What does it do to people? Can people still grow as good human beings, flourish as ethical decision makers? This is, these are questions that are not, not being asked by utilitarianism, that are not even asked by Kant. So, so I, I would say that if I'm doing an assessment process and I'm building, bringing the right skills to the assessment process, the impact on people, th those are the stakeholders, the impact on people is part of the analysis. And if you're doing the, in, in, and so if, we, if we're talking about assessment processes that are done with integrity and done with competence, that's part of what is brought to, 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 to that process. Now, the question of how you incentivize the people within organizations to do that with integrity and competence is, is, is a whole nother question. But if you're talking about competent assessments, that should be part of it. Um, now, now, there can be real disagreements about sort of what, whether some impacts are negative or positive, but at least let's have a process that illuminates it and that's sort of when we talk about a risk-based approach, I think that's probably that's what we're getting into is illuminating the issues so that they can be resolved. Well, Jana, before the break. Some kind of transport back to London. Um, uh, so, what, yes, I just wanted to echo what Marty was saying. And, and there really, um, I think the GDPR gives us enough tools to take some good judgment calls, um, not only with risk-based approach, but yes, that's exactly what risk-based approach is about, focusing on risks and harms to individuals and having a process to address those and mitigate. But I think what also our group talked about, and I think this was, this was mentioned by Luciano as well, and I want to re reinforce, ethical decision-making or judgment calls are not only about privacy protection, they're also about benefits 
the benefits of society, benefits to many, uh, the good things that can happen because we are using data in a responsible way. And I think that is also very important. And that that's also brings us back to kind of all these other fundamental rights. Here we are all privacy protectors, but if we were in a different conference, ethical decision making would be completely on another scale, right? Something totally different. So. Um, I think Luciano said, if we want to do these judgment calls, then we really have to balance and think about these things together. So we talked about whether DPAs would do such a balance mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the discharge of their statutory powers. Um, should they be doing uh, thinking about benefits? But certainly organizations as part of risk assessments have to think about purposes and benefits as well. So just to add to that, to the point. Okay. First of all, I want to thank Aurélie for reporting on the fourth group. Um, there is still something left. We'll come back after the break. But now I call a break, 15 minutes or so, and I'll see you back by four. Thank you. It, it's very uh, much encouraged here. So in case you felt inhibited so far, the message I pass on is that please just take off the brakes. But this, this doesn't need to be a very lengthy event from now on. Uh, it will inevitably end with concluding remarks, but both from the chair of the group and from uh, ADPS. But um, this is about leftovers and about major issues which are still hanging out there. Um, any one of you has a, a point to make which has not been made so far? Yes. Probably been made. Please wait for the microphone. It's probably been made before, but it probably warrants uh, making again. We've talked a lot about the uh, consequences for individuals and the responsibilities for individuals, but there are also collective um, aspects and more long-term cascading um, aspect, unintended um, societal implications that need to be thought about. And um, for me, that would suggest that there also need to be um, methods for more collective um, consideration, deliberation, uh, responsible research and innovation that involves um, communities and collective um, experimentation with the technologies. Yes, that seems well taken. Would anyone wish to take issue with that? Charles? I'm not, I don't want to take issue with it. But I'll yeah. Um, at the risk of appearing like a broken record, I would like very much to endorse that because uh, I think that, um, that those are things that are kind of left off the table in a lot of discussions about data protection and uh, and privacy, although they're very much on the table in other circles, um, not just academic circles, uh, uh, for that for that matter, and I think it's important to develop a way of reliably, reasonably reliably, although arguably, um, figuring out what the consequences are, both good and bad consequences, uh, for. A variety of, first of all, for society as a whole, whatever that is, and secondly, for particular kinds of categories and groups and so forth, and to ask questions about how are those categories derived, uh, how are they applied, what are the false positives and false negatives of assigning people to categories in the algorithms that, 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 are, uh, that are used, uh, and how people can be disadvantaged without their knowing that they are, and therefore without being able to have any redress and any recourse uh, uh, to either a data protection authority or to, or to the law. So I very much endorse that, and I see that very much as part of an, ethics appro an ethical approach to uh, the sorts of things that, uh, that you're trying to do here. What, what, what kind of governance elements you would expect there to be? Governance elements? Yeah, elements of governance in, in the line of what you're describing. You are encouraging the approach. I'm just challenging you. Is there more to be said about the governance you would need to do that? Well, I think what you could do is you could do that almost experimentally. Yeah. Uh, you could do this under the auspices of perhaps data protection authorities. 
Uh, you could do this under the auspices even of um, legislate, legislatures who commission, who might commission studies of the long-term and distant effects upon um, uh, upon entities um, that are not usually taken into consideration when when one is talking about individual privacy. So I think that those sorts of things, if they're made in public forums and debated and so on, could make a very big contribution. Yeah. Um, you want to add, develop your point? Yes. Um, I, I think um, things that work very well for me um, are collaborative design approaches um, where from the very beginning you have an iterative process and you have um, very many stakeholders involved, not just in debating the implications, but actually trying to build prototypes and experimenting yeah. with the prototypes because many of the things, as we've said many times, can't be foreseen. Yeah. And the role of art and design in that um, context can be really transformative. Um, uh, there are some colleagues that uh, build um, design fictions, for example, um, where they worked with people um, in an aging uh, context um, about building um, health monitoring technologies. And they debated all day long and had some really good ideas and um, also some really serious concerns. And then they went away and worked with um, actors and they built it. They made a design fiction of actually uh, buying such a device. So who would buy it for you or with you? Would you wear it all the time? So, um, and it was a, a device that allowed you to, to choose when to die. Um, so then from playing it really through, and building a prototype that they would actually wear for a few days and um, and really play through how they would live with it. Um, lots of new um, concerns, but also ideas for how you could live with it in a good way um, came out. So those approaches can be very productive, I think. Great. Marty? Just a, a couple of things related to that. F first, in unfairness, which is the sort of the corollary to, to, to fairness. Um, unfairness analysis um, in the United States is not just analysis of the impact on individuals, it's the impact on, on markets and communities. Um, so that, that there, there is already some, there's already um, some discussion from other jurisdictions of this concept of, of when you do an assessment, how do you assess, do assessment beyond the individual? The other thing, I think the, the, the th second point is that there is no silver bullet that solves all of the issues related to making sure that ethical assessments are done or scaled in the right way or are structured in the right way. There's, there's lots of pieces of that puzzle that, that, need, that, that need to be worked through. There's just no way, there's no single way to do it. The other thing I would, would counsel folks is in, in a world of data-driven research, the, the, the sheer amount of, of research done with data will be much greater than the type, you know, the scales of research we, we, we're used to in, in sort of a clinical setting. So the fact is that anytime we build out a governance system for this, we need to think about the scale of, of, of the types of things we're dealing with. And I think too often we're thinking in terms of methodologies we used in other mediums and domains that just really aren't scalable to the environment that we're, you know, that we're going to confront. And that, too, has ethical implications. Yeah. Sure. Uh, Jacques? Thank you. Um, we have been discussing uh, this morning, and, and so in particular also about uh, bringing in the design of the various uh, digital tools the uh, concept of uh, ethics, like we did it for privacy, and have now things like privacy by design and so on. The only problem that I feel with that is that, and I see that also a bit happening in, in privacy by design, is that it is getting based on rules, and that rules are being implemented into the systems. And if we are thinking about the future systems where 
we are working with deep learning and, and autonomous systems, these rules will be dig will be down very, very much within to the system and totally almost totally impossible to find out uh, what is really happening in the system. So the question is then, are we not going to be governed by the systems in the end, like we had in the beginning of the uh, digital period where uh, the, 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 the receptionist behind the desk always told me, I'm sorry, sir, but uh, you cannot be put into the system because you are not in accordance with the normal rules. So uh, it's always the system was, was blamed there. The question is how are we, uh, are we really going to deal with this in, in the future? Are we trying to make sure that people understand from the beginning what the consequences are uh, when you put certain data into a system and what what comes out of it that 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 is transparent and that there is accountability for that and so that you can bring it into political discussion and maybe change it then again or are we uh, just giving up and letting it go and be may I be be governed by machines in the end uh, this is a rhetorical question, of course, uh, the last. Uh, but my, my, my sense, no, 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 it's a, real, it's a real issue, obviously, but my sense is that inevitably um, the answer is going to be a mix of different approaches where, where some will be very hard rule-based and then allocating responsibility for things and liability where things go wrong, together with softer approaches uh, where professional codes and comply or explain kind of um, approaches, uh, best practices, like, for instance, the one mentioned at the back about testing and making things better. A mix of these things will happen. And if the due diligence has not been exercised, then there is a strong incentive to, uh, I'm saying, then there will be very expensive consequences, but leaving space for for uh, development. You cannot predict that and prevent all that. Um, I'm just we're, we're throwing Please. things out. Yes, he would like to intervene. Please. Uh, yes. A, a, a point, because you point, Peter, you said something that we haven't mentioned before, so I'll, I'll try to come up with one. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Something that, that I, I've been thinking about something that Luciano said earlier about how the GDPR has a lot of open-ended provisions, which will take difficult judgment calls, and this is how ethics can come in. And I was wondering, is this really new? Uh, and to what extent does the GDPR give us new challenges in this way of kind, or is this maybe just a matter of... of such judgment calls that are much more complex and numerous because I think, for example, the, the, the directive, we have a lot of experience making these difficult judgment calls. It, it's, it's the normal order of the day. Data protection law is not an area where you just have black or white. I mean, rarely do you have very clear decisions. So we have a lot of experience with that. And I think also this is the, the norm in EU law. EU law is filled with open-ended concepts like subsidiarity, proportionality, internal market, et cetera. Uh, it, it, it's kind of in the in the DNA of, of EU law. And the, this is what the court of justice does is interpret these concepts. So we have a lot of experience with this already from the directive and also from general EU law. And we should look at that maybe more, more closely and not just think this is now something completely new that's coming upon us from the GDPR. That's, it's, I, it's, that's it's certainly not. Yeah. It, it, and it, it's paradoxical because it, referring this to the GDPR, there is an obvious uh, series of complaints about prescriptiveness. And now within a very short period afterwards, we speak about open, open concepts, which of course haven't been there from the very beginning. The consequences of ignoring them have changed in, in the arrangement and who decides on what has changed. But okay. But the conceptual yes. normative um, cornerstones are still extremely, and they will be more uh, problematic in, in the future. I mean, the cornerstones being informed consent, 
personal, uh, the idea of personal data, uh, uh, purpose specification, use limitation, that, that is going to be increasingly difficult. And these are the normative cornerstones that, that guarantee our autonomy and, and, and self-determination. Um, and so that, that is, that we will have to find an answer uh, to that. Gilke? I would also be more in the line of Jeroen, I think, in this. I think nothing will change dramatically with the GDPR, but technology technology is changing a lot, which challenges how we look at our the main principles of data protection. And I think also GDPR adds some new complexities as well by having, for instance, a risk-based approach quite well defined in the GDPR, also in a recital which says what is risk and how you should evaluate risk, which all increases the difficulty of making judgment calls, but it's not a change, it's not a dramatic change, but it's an evaluation, I think, evolution more than a revolution, I would say. Yeah. In, in our group, we discussed this, this, this problem of personal data, which determines the scope, you know, or, you know the, 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 the normative frameworks apply as soon as we talk about, even if we work with a generous conception of personal data. Um, but there's a real deep philosophical semantical problem of when is information about someone and that, yeah. that is exactly. and that's going to be a real problem um, uh, so but yeah please, I think please, we're moving we're moving in the direction explain, yeah. please explain uh, who, uh, in the in the definition of personal data which has been fairly stable for the last 50 years 40 years uh, there's been a lot of attention for identifiability and anonymity. There's much less attention for the question of when does information relate so is about. Exactly. This is the aboutness. Uh, what in philosophical explain. semantics is, is yeah. referred to as aboutness. When is a chunk of information or a set of data or just yeah. a piece of a data point about someone? Yeah. And so we regardless of where yeah, the person so, is. So, and so, um, so we're moving from syntactics to semantics to pragmatics and context starts to matter in, w in which yeah. context certain things and we know that the context is a relation relational thing you take someone something out of this context you put it somewhere else the meaning changes and the and the range of options that are an actionable knowledge that comes with it uh, change. So we're moving, I think, in the future away, uh, uh, living in a big data society, we're moving away from personal data to data that can be used as an epistemic tool to get to people in the end, because that, that is what yeah. we're, that's what it's about. It's a hobby horse, I warned you. I just, uh, <laughs> Uh, but uh, we, we've had some interesting discussions when objects relate to persons and when they are held responsible as a basis of taxation or a car, etc. And so the realm, uh, a machine relates to the one who was working on the machine when the machine has a sort of a, a record of what happened when, etc. So you can, you can define uh, relevant relationships between objects and persons when they are being judged on what the thing is doing and and that is growing and obviously data, with, all with data networks. is captured of course yeah. exactly yeah. yes can, please. can i maybe we also build on that um getting back to this idea of big data um big data does not like context they want scalability they want stuff to work they don't yeah. want exceptions and so there's like a confrontation between this idea of privacy and trying to define PII, personal data, whatever, and then this kind of idea of context related. And it's, it's going to clash at some point. It already is. There's another one, which is this idea of transfer, transferability of data, where the context is lost and where traceability of data is important in that sense. So if, if that is true and, 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 and uh, we give our informed consent for, for certain information to be used, then a certain meaning is implied. I give my consent understanding full well what this means. But if it's, if it's migrating to other concepts, it, it will change the context and my informed consent expires. You know, so well, it's maybe no there is then another ground for legitimacy and it, there, there could be change of legitimacy. Legitimacy, consent, moving, and obligations, moving in, in legitimate interest, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, yeah, there seem to be a lot of leftovers. We should 
please go ahead. Okay, so, Martin, so yes. So big data is is not one big entity. B big data ha is is done in different ways. So there's a difference between big data as discovery, discovery of insights, big data as application of insights. Yeah. Big data in, in, in terms of the discovery does break the context because you're bringing data together from multiple places and, and, and putting it together to, to come up with insights. When you begin to, to use the application of big data, then context does come back in a big way. And the issues related to thinking with data, the issues related to acting with data, are different. You have to under, and you have to you have to apply the analysis differently in those in those in those in those two pieces. I, I think Yaron is, is is correct though that 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 the basic building blocks of privacy as a value and the um, the clear concepts of data protection as fair processing are more problematic in this world of, of, of lots and lots of data, of, of the application of data in new ways, of not understanding how data from one source will be pulled together. I think you know, that the work on the linkage between those, the two, you know, the, the, the constitutional value of privacy and, and, and the, the practice of fair practices that relates to data protection become a much more important issue and part of this discussion of, of the ethics that's here. And I don't think there is sort of a scholarship around that yet. I mean, I, Helke started that in some ways with, with, with this extremely long book. Um, but, um, it, but, but I think there, 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 that in terms of this concept of, of ethics, we need to do more work in that area. Conversation has touched on many points already. Uh, the course of the day, and we're adding new elements now. Uh, again, have we overlooked something relevant? Is there more to be added to the challenge already on the table of the advisory group? Can I raise a concern? Yeah, please. So uh, there, there, is, there is the development of concepts of, of how fair practice might be applied. There needs to be judgments about how that might happen. Um, I think in many ways there's a lot of uncertainty around how the general data protection regulation and the data protection board are going to operate and how the work of the EDPS on ethics is going to sort of link into th that work. And I was just wondering, and that concerns me, how that, that gets linked together. And maybe it's inappropriate to say that, but that concerns me. OK, we'll, we'll park that. <laughs> and I will come back to that in next steps, maybe. Um, with that. Yes, yeah, Sarah, please. please. If, I, if I'm allowed to dump. I'm not shortcutting anybody, but I'm just giving you ample time to. If I'm allowed to dump uh, some yes. extra points to consider on this group, I think um, we had an interesting discussion in the Dignity Group early on and uh, on Kant's perception on, of dignity, um, which is based on several pillars. Um, one of them being that dignity is about the autonomy of the individual, yeah? Um, which directly links in our big data world, where, is, uh, where increasingly we have less autonomy um, if uh, machines nudge us or if um, big data profiles say that we don't get a credit line or something like that. This is uh, one aspect of dignity that is clearly rela uh, related to data protection. And I think that, that, that the general data protection regulation is not going... Uh, far enough yeah, in terms of really regulating um, and as well enforcing through the appropriate technical standards the possibility for people to see what's happening. Yeah. That's one point. And the uh, second point of Kant's perception of dignity is um, that we actually have the right to manage our own identity, to be masters of our identity um, and to determine who we are. 
And um, through the big data world, this is, uh, this is a little bit taken away from us. And, and, and here again, um, the GDPR, of course, it, suff it, it covers things like um, profiling and, mm -hmm. and, and purpose-related processing and so on. But um, I think now is the point where we have to think about the delegated acts. Yeah? And the delegated acts... Um, are are being um, I don't know who is going to take care of this I don't know what role the EDPS will play uh, in in this in this arena, Thank and you. how you are actually going to ramp up the standardization bodies. Yeah. Commission representatives have I think left the room. The answer is <laughs> <laughs> they are supposed to think about this, and uh, some of it will be used, some of it not yet, and some of it will be there to be used at the right time, and that. So actually, the conversation will go on. Uh, I think this is a very, very good point uh, to raise at this point. Um, this, this tempering or the technology that the advanced digital technology um, drawing upon personal data um, that allows our image of ourselves to be manipulated and tainted. And, and also our image and perception of the range of options that are open to us are tempered with, you know, outside of our control. So on both sides, we are, our autonomy or our Kantian kind of self-legislating nature of uh, as, as moral persons is, is, is tainted or compromised in that sense. To react on substance, there was a reference to implementing acts. And I was speaking about all the technical things following this. But there, uh, the common element is there are, of course, many issues to be further developed um, you said the GDPR doesn't go far enough. This is how far we've managed a very complicated process. And so how do we deal with some of those issues which are outside and but still relevant? And um, in what ways could we address them? Is, is that perhaps also a role for the ethics, digital ethics thinking to stimulate uh, doing the right thing at the right time in ways which lead to acceptable outcomes, even where the law, strict to sensu, has not named things specifically. And this is the discussion about is it in, is it out, and how to reach it. The discussion will no doubt continue. Um, I'm trying to see whether there is still anything left at this stage. And if that's not the case, this would be the appropriate moment to pass the floor to whoever is next. Uh, I should check. Giovanni is first. But my, my sense is, and, and Peter, why don't you? Well, um, so far, um, this has been an incredibly interesting day. Um, and I've been watching your faces all through the afternoon and uh, there was no one dozing off. Uh, a few who seen they were, were actually reflecting. I saw that because they suddenly reacted when something happened. So we've, we've seen a very engaged audience and um, the few signals I received from the group suggested that we've been also quite useful to them. Now, thank you for uh, staying this long. I'm going to give the floor to yeah. to Peter, and and then we go from there. Thank you. Then there were those who were trying to doze off but couldn't find a quiet place. <laughs> um, I'm trying to keep my mouth shut as much as possible and listen, listen to you and listen to the input. I think my closing remarks would take the form of an extended uh, thank you. Uh, it's really unusual to have such a group of competent, experienced, and knowledgeable people sit around and talk with us and give of themselves all day long for one purpose. And it's, uh, we're really, really grateful to that from the, from the EAG and I think the, the, the unit who's helping us at the, at the EDPS is, uh, agrees with me on that, on that point. So thank you very, very much for that, for that input. Um, I, I'm left a little bit uh, concerned, and I think that's a good place to be, uh, 
concerned by some of the contradictions, some of the some of the undecided issues that we've that have come up, uh, some of the um, uh, unease that I hear in the interventions, that I see in the discussions. I think that's okay. That's a good place to be. Uh, there's there's the one which revolves around the notion of ethics and digital ethics that we've been uh, revisiting in different from different angles all day long. There's the other one which is concerning the idea of dignity. There's several other tangential minor minor ones, but I think even as much as some today have argued that that there's something strong called normative ethics which has to be at the heart of what we're going to do when we're developing the next generation of uh, data protection and privacy uh, governance. Uh, most of us are talking about ethics as a kind of um, uh, negotiation of values, a, a discussion, a conversation about values. Nobody is really saying, or not many of us are really saying, that we should set up a, a, a hard uh, list of um, rules that should be then applicable to determined, predetermined uh, context. And even though many of us have talked about ethical this and ethical that, what we really need to be sticking to, and what I think we mostly are sticking to, is some idea about ethics as a conversation, uh, a negotiation of what's important to us and what's not important to us, without any transcendental, uh, without any transcendental foundation. So we see that in many contexts, most of which come in the form of some sort of contextualization. I mean, we have a handful of ethicists in the room and 40 other highly specialized, highly knowledgeable people all talking about value issues, ethical issues in their own way. And so what we've, what we've heard today is kind of a narrative about context, about embedding, about how these fit into society, how they fit into our institutions, how these questions and and negotiations have to do with where they're being carried out, to what end, to what impact, uh, and what kind of process and practices they, they mobilize in order to take place. So when we're talking about a new di digital ethics, and which I'm very glad we are talking about, I think this is the place where the conversation is going to continue, the, context the contextual one, not the transcendental one, uh, not the Kantian one that Kant has been so warmly evoked so many times today without uh, really drawing the, the consequences. Um, and I think, I mean, it just came up with your comment about dignity just right, right at the very end, which was seconded by Yurun, and, and which uh, we clearly understand the Kantian origins of human dignity. And I have not heard any intervention which said these are still 100% valid. Every intervention which evoked dignity in that, those terms said something like, these are being tainted, as you said, or these being weakened or compromised. Or we need to have some other way of looking at that. So, and then some of us are talking about reconceptualizing dignity, reconceptualizing ethics. That's what we're talking about. And I think there's a broad consensus uh, for that in the group, even though we hear uh, at times a stronger definition of ethics uh, being, being used. So on that, on that note, I think it's, a, it's an optimistic one. We have a, we have a vision of, of where we need to go. We have a vision of the kind of setting or context in which a new kind of digital ethics is going to have to be played out. And now the work is to be done, partially by our group, but uh, partially by the EDPS and partially by Europe and the European project uh, at large. So thanks very much for your engagement. Thank you, Peter one, thank you, Peter two. Oh, yes. And um, we are approaching uh, the conclusion of um, a very promising um, working day. Um, please do not consider these remarks as conclusive remarks, but actually as opening remarks, because I think today um, we uh, analyze the, the foundations of um, a debate we, we would like to uh, to continue. I'm very reassured about the um, the outcome. Um, we we plan to have no more than 40 uh, selected um, distinguished um, experts, and not, notwithstanding uh, difficulties concerning conflicting uh, events taking place, 
uh, today and, and even the strike in, in, in Brussels, I think uh, not only because of the engagement, but uh, in terms of uh, uh, richness of, of the debate, um, we, we, we succeeded. Um, and my first comment, my first takeaway is that it has been um, a brilliant uh, uh, idea to, to have you uh, with us uh, today. It's an investment uh, good for uh, good for value. Uh, my preliminary remark relates to the uh, interesting in introduction on mapping. I mean uh, sources, and and then my my reaction was to which extent this um, I mean variety or, or different documentation uh, is relevant for for regulators. I think this is the, the challenge around us and for the DPS in, in, in particular. So to, to, to analyze what the consequences could, could be, uh, which kind of actions can, can be taken by different uh, regulation, not, no, regulators, not only at the EU level. It's difficult to raise conclusions because we have heard, um, I mean, a, a variety of, of different uh, and even opposite uh, views. This is exactly a confirmation about the beauty of a debate and, and a discussion. We don't want to uh, uh, necessarily orient uh, future debates in a specific way. Uh, I will come back to, to this point. I, I just have a couple of uh, perhaps four takeaways. Um, since when Peter was um, starting uh, the, this last uh, summary of the uh, debate in the, in the breakout sessions, I deliberately, um, I mean, uh, concentrated myself in uh, reading back the documents we, we have adopted last year, uh, the opinion on, on ethics, a um, few speeches on, on, on this area, uh, the decision launching the uh, advisory group, to see more or less one year later to which extent this document and, and are still valid with particular regard to, to the process. And, and I got once again the confirmation that we are on, on the right track. So I would like to be very grateful with um, Delphine, uh, Ilke, Carolina, and everybody uh, working in uh, in the house. Uh, also on behalf of, of Wojciech for um, I mean the organization of today's uh, first uh, first workshop. The first of the four takeaways is that, um, and, and this is something I. I I have read back in, in, in the DBS document, is that um, indeed um, technology is uh, likely to not only influence um, the new generation of processing of personal data, but also um, is likely to continue to dictate and even more uh, values and, and, and rights. Uh, and therefore, I think we, we, we should analyze this process uh, normally speaking, um, by default, the data protection regulators uh, speak to um, data controllers only, uh, while perhaps uh, we, we have to also consider the future design of products and, and, uh, and services. I'm now not only referring to artificial intelligence or uh, self-driven cars. The second takeaway relates to uh, the assumption that in today's digital environment uh, uh, adherence to uh, the law uh, is not enough. I, I think uh, we, we, we should continue working on, on this perspective. The third one, um, and this is, this is extremely interesting for an institution as the DPS, are we entitled as European Union institution or as data protection community to to be engaged in such a debate? I think yes. I think the data protection community, including uh, the, the DPS, has still uh, a big interest to analyze um, and pioneer philosophical and, and moral implications of the processing of personal data. It has been said that ethics is not only personal information, but it's clear that uh, we should go um, as regulators um, into a multidisciplinary analysis to better understand the background around the, the mere processing of personal uh, information. And finally, I think we should also um, invest energies to understand what it means 
uh, to empower individuals with the GDPR and, and, and other legal instruments against the trend where data subjects are uh, merely uh, passive uh, objects, uh, prosumers, it has been said. I have seen, uh, particularly this afternoon, um, a couple of things where I'm expecting an increased debate. Um, the first one uh, relates to the differences in terms of uh, cultural values uh, in the world around uh, uh, ethics and dignity, so to which extent the international dimension may affect uh, um, I mean, the, the, the debate. And the second one, um, Marty uh, has referred uh, in his last intervention to, to big data. And perhaps I'm expecting more um, from, from ourselves first to, to see um, the results of the challenges of, of the big data. There are different schools of thought. Um, people thinking that this is another, uh, not the last one, challenge in terms of uh, data protection uh, principles. Uh, similar to those when we moved from uh, manual to automated, from analogic to digital, from uh, um, telecommunications to uh, electronic uh, networks, from the pioneeristic uh, e-commerce to the information society. Uh, and therefore, uh, according to this first vision, there is no need, uh, I mean, to, to consider um, big data as a revolutionary uh, challenge. While others are, are saying that data protection principles for the first time are in, in some way at risk, uh, it, they may be affected in terms of data retention, controllership, certain definitions, um, including the one of um, data, uh, data subject, purpose limitation uh, principle, transparency particularly. So um, I would uh, personally first uh, invest more in energies to understand to which extent um, big data means um, big data protection. Um, and also to see if in terms of um, values and balance of interest, we, we have to allow an increased processing of personal data aiming at reinforcing a certain public interest or in terms of economic well-being. Um, and we, we know that now, in particular in the GDPR, we have such a notion of pseudonymized um, information. We don't have all the answers to um, yet to um, orient the, the debate, but I think uh, one preliminary conclusion of today's workshop is that um, the process we have identified um, is the, the, the right one to establish uh, an independent uh, advisory uh, board. We, we, we respect what, what you are doing and we will never influence um, your, um, your conclusions. Um, we did not identify big fishes in, 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 in the world with full respect over your distinguished career, but we identified the best group that can work together by uh, merging different uh, experiences, not only in, in the EU, people that can work in, in, in practice. Uh, and, uh, and perhaps we can even then imagine different interviews at different stages with other, with other stakeholders. Um, so I think... Um, notwithstanding the reduced size of, of, of the event, this model can be duplicated in, in the second workshop. Th this time you, you will see at, at distance the, the, the results with the scientific uh, community. And, and you know uh, what we have uh, planned uh, to invite the advisory board as a result of the second workshop to produce an interim uh, draft document to submit it to public consultation because we said this is not an exercise in, in, in camera, should be transparent and public at different stages. Um, and right after the public consultation, we would like to have an international public event, um, hopefully here in, uh, in Brussels. 
uh, the Executive Committee of the International Conference uh, has identified Hong Kong as the uh, venue for uh, the next year edition of the International Conference. We are analyzing together with other colleagues, um, um, I mean, where to place this uh, event and, and how to organize it in between end of next year and, uh, let's say, second half of, of 20, uh, 2018 um, as the International Conference of Privacy and Data Protection Commissions or as a separate uh, um, event to, to be also perhaps organized together with, uh, with other colleagues. And then to um, have right after this final uh, public uh, debate um, a final outcome by the, the same the same board um, I mean to to summarize the the state of play so it's um, it's a big work first of all uh, I mean the the people we we, we have selected um, we will interact with other bodies uh, at EU and outside the uh, EU level um, we invited for today the president of the um, group of ethics working together with the commission. I think he, he will join us at the occasion of the second uh, workshop. So uh, all in all, I can simply say to, to all of you on behalf of uh, Wojciech, thank you um, very much uh, for your engagement. Um, and follow us not only via tweets or, or by consulting the website, but be, being proactive in, in the latter stage. And once again, a special thank to uh, Peter. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to see you uh, back in this house.